Welcome to the More Perfect Union, the podcast that offers real debate without the hate. I'm Kevin Kelton, and I'm here along with Greg Matusak. Hey, Kevin. You know, I like to think of myself as a pretty confident person, but I don't know if you heard Matt Gates just announced yesterday, I think, that he's running for a re-election. And I've never been investigated by the FBI for having sex with underage children, but I would think that would sway me from running for re-election, but I have to hand it. That's some that's some <laughs> confidence. So here's see you. I hope to have that level of confidence. I know this is a busy week, so we're not going to get to that story, no. but that alone, the confidence of that, that is the cut level of confidence. I want to know what brand deodorant that man is using. <laughs> also, here is Joe Seart. First day of spring and I'm feeling good as ever. I've already got shorts on and I am ready for summertime. I'm very, very pleased that you're wearing shorts. Yeah, yeah you uh, <laughs> Very relieved is what I was looking for. Well, we're going to jump right into the news of the week. Well, of course, everybody's still talking about the Ukrainian-Russia war. And what I'm seeing uh, is turning into a new Cold War. Now, obviously, I'm not the first, second, or 50th person to say that. But I did want to talk about what a Cold War would mean for us in this crisis and beyond when the crisis is finally somehow resolved. So first of all, do you guys see us being in a Cold War beyond the end of the actual on-the-ground fighting there? It, depending on what you mean by Cold War, will we go to 1960s, everyone hide under your desk war? Or will we go to 1940s, you know, ration cards? Will doctors get gas stickers with the letter A on it? That kind of Cold War. You know, I'm thinking I, more the 1960s, 70s. Possibly. But there will always be half the country that will say none of this is for real. And OK, it's, well, it's, let's forget that right. because those people, you know, <laughs> trying to debate with them. And I'm going to talk to that in a minute. But OK, I mean, um, we'll, we'll just be chasing our tails if we're trying to convince the people that don't believe in, in COVID vaccines that the war in Ukraine is actually happening. Right. Right. So we talked about this a little last week. What would a post Ukraine conflict look like with Vladimir Putin? Yes, having someone who about that specifically. Yes. Right. And, and this is kind of where it is. What would having a as Joe Biden called him a war criminal? As someone who has nuclear weapons, as someone who has this huge, he's a huge economic power. And as long as he's still closely allied with China, although China's kind of moving away from him, the more that these horrible, horrific pictures of Ukraine are coming out, we are going to ha live in fear, at least for a while. I did not live through the Cold War, so I don't know necessarily what to expect. I joked about I think last week about things almost becoming like Dr. Strangelove. And <laughs> even though that was like a throwaway joke, that's feeling more and more likely. That is where I wanted to go with this conversation, because that's where I'm afraid things are going. So I'm going to pull the age card this week. You guys always make fun of me and rightfully so for being, you know, quite a bit older than you. I, I don't quite even, a bit. I, we quite don't even bit. want to tell the audience how much older I am than Joe. But but I did. I was alive during the 60s and not just alive, but, you know, old enough to be aware during the height of the Cold War from the Cuban Missile Crisis into the 70s. And yes, everybody knows about the air raid drills in and, and the, the nuclear bomb drills or whatever you want to call it in schools. And yes, you know, my classes had those as well, but it was so much more than that. I want to tell you just two quick stories. First of all, you would occasionally hear in my town, which I grew up in, in Rockville Center, Long Island, you would occasionally hear in the distance what we call air raid sirens. I don't know what those things were when they were going off, but you would hear them occasionally and you would wonder, should I be going someplace? Should I be doing something? Why is that siren going off in the distance in my town? And it's, it's a, you know, back then it was a very off putting feeling. When I went to camp in the mid 60s, they liked to break color war. You guys know what color war was at sleepaway camps, right? Yeah. 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 Sure. They would break yeah. the camp into two different 
teams and then you'd compete. But they would always, quote unquote, break color war in some new and novel way. And one year they did it by having a, a siren go off at two o'clock in the morning Ooh. and telling all the kids. And, you know, these are kids from from six years old up through, you know, teens. Get out of your bunks. Get out of your bunks. Go to the center of the camp. Go to the center of the camp. And a few of us thought they were waking us up because we were under nuclear attack. OK, so cool idea from the camp. And I don't blame them. I'm not mad at them. But that was the way we thought back then. And you're living with that kind of fear. In my house, I had a small house. I had my parents had a small house in Rockville Center. And they were so concerned about the possibility of an atomic exchange that they built in our basement a full fallout shelter. Now, you may have seen pictures of fallout shelters, you know, in textbooks, or maybe you've seen them on the web where they're like little bunkers that people have out and back or in their, you know, their woodshed or something. This was a full room with cinder block walls, two reinforced doors, air filters that you had to manually crank to get fresh air from the outside that would be filtered. And we kept clothing and rations in there and had to resupply them, you know, every six months so they wouldn't go bad. I once opened a can that we had left in there for like over six months, a can of like beans or chili or something, and it was empty. (laughs) That's that's how old that can was. But my point is, and I know I've spoken long here, that what we lived through in the 60s should not just be kind of an abstract idea, because I think we might be back to some semblance of that even after the actual fighting and and killing in Ukraine, quote, hopefully is over. You you know, when I was, I'm going to state the obvious, I'm not as old as you. I don't remember that. We did not have a fallout shelter, but I do remember when I was like in sixth grade, I was at the very, very tail end of communism in the Cold War. And they showed us the day after. Do you remember that film? Sure, sure. Yeah, it was a TV event. And it was a... And for those of you who don't remember it, it was a, it was like a, the a nuclear war happened and these are the survivors. And long story short is no one was happy. And they showed it to us at school, which was just frightening. And we had to get our parents to sign a letter that said we could watch it. And I mean, we had read we had read some you know dystopian books and we had read a couple of things on this, but this was just horrible. Yeah. And there were nightmares and there's counseling sessions. And I don't think they were count I don't think we did counseling back then because it was the 80s and we were tough. We just said no. <laughs> and then all of a sudden communism fell. Ronald Reagan said something to a wall and it, <laughs> it was gone. And I can't imagine people going back to that kind of group fear. Even if it is a possibility, people will not, will just, you know, say like, no, no, it will never happen. It's okay. it, too many okay. actors understand the concept. Oh. Yeah. I'm going to show my age now and I'm like kind of totally detached from this whole Cold War thing. But everything you brought up kind of stirred a couple stories in me. Do you remember the Twilight Zone episode where there was the one family that had the bomb shelter and then they all get together and they're all friends. But then when the shit starts coming down, they start pointing fingers and looking at each other. And to me, that kind of. Well, you're, I think you're you're blending together two different Twilight Zones. Oh, I but might yes. be because I'm a but huge yes, you're fan right. of There it. was a Twilight Zone about this exact topic. I think what you're thinking of is the one where the, the one family has a fallout shelter, like yep. my family did, and there's something happens. They believe that there's a nuclear war outside, and they have friends banging on the doors to let them in, and they're they're afraid to let them in. Yeah, and then it shows that divide and that fear, and I think it encapsulated that time. Yeah. And by the way, my family had that conversation. I had that conversation with my parents. My my best friend back then was a kid named Robert Katz, and they lived around the corner from us. And I said, well, you know, if there's ever a, a nuclear war, we're going to let the Katzes come in with us. Right. And it was like, Kevin, that shelter is just for our family. It's not, we're not being selfish. And they explained to me the logistics of it. And, you know, and they said, you can't open the door because if you open the door, you could be letting in nuclear fallout. And yeah, it was a tough thing to go through to think, God, I have to leave my friends out there to die because they don't have their own shelter. Jeez. My dad never talked about his military service, but when he did, he dropped like these little gems 
And one time we were hearing about the Cuban Missile Crisis, and he's like, yeah, I was sitting in a submarine just off the Bay of Pigs waiting to see what we were doing. Wow. And that's where the story ended. Those are three unrelated things that just kind of encapsulate the fear of the Cold War era. And I don't think that's something we've felt to this degree in this country till now. Well, you know, I think I think a lot of it has to do with modern Americans now. If they weren't willing to put a mask on, okay, if they weren't willing to put up with the, that kind of inconvenience, can you see Americans putting up with the, the other kind of fear? They just there's a disconnect. They yeah. can't do it. Yeah. And now that mask mandates are over, they are ready to disconnect other issues. You know, I mean, they're like, we're just not having this. What other things can we ignore? It's truly amazing. In my- my community, as our listeners know, I moved to Texas about two years ago. I live in a small community uh, about 30 miles north of Austin. It's a subdivision. And at the front of the subdivision where they, they have the, the big wall that has the name of the subdivision on it, in the middle of last week, they wrapped on each side a Ukrainian flag all the way around that wall on both sides. And I thought it was really special. I took a photo of it and I posted it. Not only is it now the cover photo on my personal page, but I posted it in a couple of groups that are associated with my town, you know, to say, wow, isn't this a cool thing that our community has done? But it brought out all of these probably right wing conservatives. I'm just assuming. Just assuming. Who are so upset that they put up a Ukrainian flag in a Texas community. I mean, they're just incensed and enraged. And what we need is more American flags. And what about inflation? And what about the invasion of our southern border? Why is that less important than the invasion of Ukraine? And all of these bizarre arguments that don't even make sense. They're they're equating. I tried to explain this to one person. I said, the southern border, yes, we have a problem, but you're talking about mostly, mostly Central American refugees trying to come here for a better life. How do you equate that with the Russian army going into a sovereign country and murdering, bombing schools, churches, hospitals, maternity wards? How do you equate the two? And they think I'm the one that doesn't get it. All right. You're crazy. This yeah. is this is on you. Yeah. All right. I mean. In, <laughs> I'd like to say that this is just a Texas thing, that, that there's still some sort of residual butt hurt from the Alamo. <laughs> but it's something else. I mean, it's all of America. That it's has all this, over America. It's all I over. Mean, it's it's all over. We all have that residual butt hurt. I mean, I have neighbors who want to use the phrase America first. Oh, they used I, it in this thread. I know over they Over and did. over again, America I first. Know. And they don't know that. <laughs> and by the way, these are the same people who were telling me that I'm wrong to support Ukraine because... Because there's a Nazi element there. And they're the America first people who essentially were, you know, wanted to let the Nazis have free roam in Europe in, in 1939, 1940, 1941. Oh, let's be clear. And is that the American first group, the people who keep saying American first are white nationalists. They yes. are aligned with that group. And even if they say, well, I'm not a white nationalist, the term America first has been adopted by the white nationalist groups. And if you don't, if you're saying, well, I don't actually know what a white nationalist is, that's a Nazi. Okay. (laughs) It's a Nazi. I would take exception with that. They share some common traits. Let's talk about this thing, the denazification of Ukraine, which is, of course, the ridiculous pretext that Putin is using to justify the invasion. Everybody knows that Vladimir Zelensky is a Jewish man who's had relatives, his father and two or three brothers killed, you know, during World War II by the Nazis. Everybody knows that. Let's not even go there. The argument that there is a a Nazi problem in Ukraine is inaccurate. And it's because like the United States, they have a far right there too. They have a a Ukraine first kind of a, a mentality there among some elements in their society. Okay, not a majority, okay. not even a large plurality. Uh, all right. I need to, I, 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 no, 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 no. I need to stop you right there. Okay. Because because you say some things that, that are problematic. One, they do have a Nazi problem. They do. Any place you have Nazis, there's a problem. Well, okay? they, have not, they have some Nazis in the country. We have Nazis in this country. Right. Does and the United they, States have a Nazi problem? We do. As a matter of fact, the- This the is real debate without the hate. I know. Homeland Security and every national intelligence 
program has said that the next terrorist attack is probably going to come from white nationalists and some sort of group aligned with homegrown Nazis, okay, with some sort of far right group. That is where our problem is. It's not going to come from illegal immigrants, the MI6, what's the, what's um, M13. M13. It's not going to come from there. It's going to come from far right white nationalist group. And they are. And that's a problem. Yes, it's going to come from them. And and if we go back through the history, at one point before World War II, Ukraine had 2.7 million Jewish residents. Today, they have somewhere between 30 to 50,000. Ukraine had a huge huge problem. They had an anti-Semitic problem. Absolutely. Yes, and they, they did. And it. It, historical. And they have. They've done a wonderful job. But anytime you have a Nazi, you have a problem. No, no, that's not, I'm sorry. That's not true. Then, then the United States needs to be denazified. Maybe you think we do. We do. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. If you think that France doesn't have Nazis? Yes. There is okay. a Nazi problem but, worldwide. But, so so but I'm, what not, I'm trying to do, did, Greg, I think we're it, saying the same thing, but I think you're missing my point. The uh, the people who, who don't even like the idea of supporting Ukraine, they don't even like the idea that somebody might put up a blue and yellow flag. They're using as a pretext to be against that, that we're supporting Nazis. Right. So That's my point. The, the, we're not, the, the United States government is not supporting Nazis in Ukraine. No, we aren't. But the problem is it didn't rise to the problem. But so I'm just you telling have. you, Greg, and we're having a really I, I'm happy that I we're think it's a nuance. It's more of a nuanced it's discussion. A, it's a nuanced discussion. But just to make sure you understand my point, because I don't want to be misunderstood by you or by our listeners. Right. I'm not saying that there aren't Nazis in the country, and I'm not saying that Nazis shouldn't right. be dealt with. I'm saying that people in this country who are upset that the United States is supporting the Ukrainian resistance and using as a pretext to be against that, that we are somehow supporting a Nazi government. That not a, is you're pure right. fiction. You are absolutely right with that. And the concept that the Ukrainian government was a Nazi government or that entire regions were ruled by Nazis. That's fiction. Let me go to some detail on that because I read something that I thought was very interesting. So one of the reasons that Putin has used this terminology and an argument that people have found to support it is there is an organization that at one point was in the Ukraine. Let's see if I can find it in my notes here. But it was a, a, a Ukrainian nationalist organization that was very big in World War II in terms of defending Ukraine. They had Nazi elements. Now, we're 50, 60 years out from World War II now, or maybe closer to 70 or 80. And there are people there who are putting up statues to honor some of these World War II heroes. Now, they're heroes for their country. They're World War II heroes. The problem is that some of those people had ties to Nazism. Yes. That is very similar to in this country. There are people that are putting up statues of individuals that they believe were Civil War heroes who were Confederates and probably racists. That doesn't mean that everyone who has a problem with taking down Civil War monuments is a racist. It means it's a nuanced problem. Now, I've spoken about this on this show before. My town has a Civil War statue like that, and there is a movement to get it taken down. There's a lot of people who want to keep it here. I don't think every one of them is a racist. I think they're just misinformed and misunderstand the nuance of the issue. Yeah, I agree. And that's what's happening in Ukraine is my point is they're saying, well, they want to put up statues of these World War II heroes. Some of those World War II heroes collaborated with the Nazis. Therefore, they love Nazis. That's my point. It's a little more nuanced in the Ukraine, but it's not, it doesn't rise to the level of being invaded and schools should be bombed. Okay, so let's move on to some other topics, unless anybody has anything else they want to throw in about the war in Ukraine. The only Uh, things I have about the war in Ukraine is I wanted to quickly bring up, because I found an article, it was an Al Jazeera article that kind of talked about the countries that people from Ukraine are fleeing to, and I thought it was interesting. Now, Poland has about two million ten thousand six hundred and ninety three according to this article romania has about five hundred and eighteen thousand moldova about three hundred and fifty nine thousand but the number that was amazing to me if you go down the list one hundred and eighty four thousand five hundred and sixty three have fled to russia and to me 
I don't know what that's due to. Like, if you look at it on a human level, there has to be family there. They have to be going to be with someone they care about. Or maybe the level of misinformation in the media has gotten to them. But to me, that's way too big a number to be fleeing to the country that's attacking you. Well, you know, on its face, it does seem confusing. But let's remember that there's a large Russian population and Russian speaking population in Ukraine, especially in the eastern border provinces that Donbass, I believe, is one of them. I forget the name of the other that we th- that people originally thought might be the, the limited objective of Putin. But in those areas, there are a lot of people who either are Russians or have Russian ancestry or speak Russian and identify with Russia. And so it might be a lot of those people that are going to Russia. And also remember, if, if you're living, let's put it this way, if you're living in New Jersey and you have to get out of New Jersey because it's being invaded, and if you live on the eastern side of New Jersey, you're not going to a West Western state. You're trying to go to the next Eastern state. True. Yeah. Okay. So the people on the Eastern side of Ukraine to, to get out of that country, are they going to go all the way across a very large landmass where there's a war going on? Or do they go into Russia where they they know they'll probably be safer? Yeah. Any port in the storm. And I don't, there's poor people. I mean, and they're probably they were probably told, look, you, you can either go that way and we'll see you in three weeks if you keep going towards Ukraine, or you can go back into Russia where everything will be okay. We'll take care of you. Don't worry. But, wink, a, but an interesting point, an interesting statistic. I'm glad you brought that up. Let's talk about COVID at two years of age. First of all, should we sing happy birthday? Uh <laughs> do you do you remember where you were? When you when you actually said like, hey, this thing is serious. I so remember it. Yes, uh, because I had sold my house the year before in California and Jessica had sold her condo and we were renting an apartment in West Los Angeles. But we had just put an offer on and had an accepted offer on the house that we're now in. And that offer was accepted 10 days before COVID became a thing. And I remember those three or four days from, let's say, the 8th of March to the 11th of March, when it became obvious that this was going to be a, you know, a massive economic and cultural problem. And I thought, oh, my God, I have made the stupidest move in the world. I've got to get out of the sale of this house. It's it's going to be the investment from hell. And I actually tried to back out and <laughs> the, the owners threatened to sue me. <laughs> And uh, I decided that I would be in litigation for years and probably lose whatever I would lose on the transaction. I'd lose it in legal costs. So I went through with it. And long story short, I'm now sitting in a great house that's gone up in value almost $200,000. So (laughs) it shows you what I knew at the time. But yes, I remember where I was. (laughs) Joe, where were you? Ooh, I don't remember where I was when it got serious. I remember where I was when I thought it got ridiculous. And I was at my mom's house one day and I was still in the grocery store business and I'm watching this news report with detailed instructions on how to wash your hands. And I just looked at my mom and I'm like, are, are they serious? Like, are we that dumb that we got to let people know like how long they got to fucking wash their hands and like what temperature. And then (laughs) over the next month or so, You know, I went from being somebody that's like, why am I going to wear a mask? Like, what is this? To like, this is serious. And we've got like an informed versus an uninformed problem in this country. And it almost took like that Republican Democrat divide and did it times a hundred. You heard a hundred different theories about why people were getting COVID, why it's stupid. You got to wear a mask. And like, I started looking at people that I thought I respected before, and I'm like, oh, my God. You yes. were an essential worker. You, oh, don't think I didn't bring it up. My brother is a You're state- barely an essential worker here. <laughs> my brother <laughs> is a state police officer, and I started telling him, I'm like, you know, we're on the same level, right? Like, we're like, <laughs> we're that. just as important. <laughs> I go to work and make sure these motherfuckers know why we don't have toilet paper. I'm saving lives. (laughs) I remember that weird time where it was, it felt like the world was losing their minds. 
And I was, I didn't know what yep. to think. I'd never been through anything like that. Uh, I was, I was <laughs> headed to a saxophone convention of all silly things. <laughs> and all I saw all these conventions being canceled and I went, I, I got there. And of course at a saxophone convention, everyone does is they play other people's saxophones. And I just remember thinking, I don't know if this is a good idea, but it didn't stop me. And it was in Arizona and, uh, and it was the desert fauna or something, but I got the worst allergies of my life. And I remember I was flying back and all I did was cough and get sick and just couldn't stop coughing. And everyone on the plane asked to move away from me. <laughs> and I remember I was like, I think this is serious. And the very next day I got home, everything shut down, the planes, the schools, my kids stopped going to school. And I was like, oh, crap. I don't think I should have gone to that convention. And I was for sure thought that I was sick. And luckily I wasn't. Um, it worked out well, but I thought, wow, that was really dumb. It was a great convention, by the way. I'm glad I went. <laughs> um, but yeah. So, so let's talk about where we are now. Obviously, things have relaxed quite a bit. There are virtually no more mask mandates. Some 65% of the country has gotten two or more COVID shots but 30, 35% yet to get it, uh, or at least haven't had enough to be fully vaccinated. You know, they, they're talking about uh, the, the new variant, the BA.2 variant. I think, I don't know how they pronounce it, but it says BA.2 in the newspapers. Um, there's the, the Delta Cron variant that they're also worried about. And things are surging in China. They're surging in, in, in the UK. I have a feeling we're going to see another surge in this country within two months. And I just wonder what's going to happen because people are not going back to masking. Uh, you know, I just don't know what's going to happen. They're going to have to. We in Ohio have pretty much dropped all mandates. Uh, I still wear my mask because I'm, I'm mentally scarred by everything that's happened in the last well, two years. People like you and I, when we go into a box store, we'll put on our mask. If we're going to, you know, maybe to a movie theater or concert, I have to admit, I've gone to movie theaters and haven't worn my mask, but that would not be an inconvenience for me to wear it in public. I haven't gone to a movie theater in over two years. And in fact, I just told my wife, I'm going on vacation in a week or two. I said, while we're gone, I think at this, where we're going, uh, I think we should go to a, find a drive-in movie theater because the girls, because my children haven't seen a movie. And my wife said, oh, I've never been to a drive-in movie theater, which shocked. Who hasn't I've been, never to, a been to one? Oh my god! What's wrong with you people? A, a lot is wrong with me. That's you live in Texas. It's, well, for it's two like, years, but I've never been to a drive-in. You're kidding, Joe? Have you been to a drive-in? I have been to a drive-in, and I'm surprised because I feel like drive-ins were the only way to see a movie when Kevin was a kid. I yeah, think it would exactly. be cool as heck to do it, I, and I meant to do it. I wanted to do it. It just hasn't happened. Oh, they're so much fun. I, I mean, it is a blast. I'm sure and on it is. a nice night. You can sit I'm on not, top of the car. I'm not putting it down at all. I'd go tomorrow. You know what? This is what we're going to do this summer. I'm going to drive. I'm going to drive down there. We'll go to a drive in. I'll say I'll wait from you from my car because Lord <laughs> knows I will not go into places um, unless anytime I, I'm wearing a mask. If I'm talking to people, unless it's my immediate family. I mean, that's just how I will probably be for the next couple of years. I can't imagine otherwise. Joe, I would imagine Connecticut is a somewhat more left of center type of culture. It wouldn't be as hard to convert back to mask wearing where you are. Is Do you think that's about right? No, I mean... My hometown has a certain amount of ignorance, and I probably carried that with me because I went to a concert last night and <laughs> I did not wear a mask because I'm an idiot. And my buddy that I was with was like, well, you've already had it. And I mean, you probably won't catch it again. And I let that thinking affect what I did. Like, I was not comfortable going into this venue just yeah. having COVID two weeks ago. And I was very nervous about it, but I went out and about. It was in Massachusetts. Yeah, but you, you nobody won't catch anything at a Hootie and the Blowfish concert. I mean, <laughs> come on. <laughs> no, I mean, where I went, it, 
it wasn't terribly packed at the beginning, so I felt good. But the more people packed in, the more nervous I got. And it was kind of like a hardcore music crowd. So I'm like, somebody in here has got something. And I, I kind of found it sad for myself that after what we've gone through for two years, after having experienced COVID, I still didn't put on my mask in that big situation. Yeah. it's And again, we are probably more inclined to wear masks than uh, I'm going to just say uh, euphemistically the average American. So again, just to put a, a cap on it, my concern is, is that we're going to have another surge. Hopefully this will not be as deadly a variant in terms of putting people either critically ill or killing them. But I do think that we're going to be in trouble because social distancing, mask wearing is not going to be around. And I think that even people who are boosted, I think those boosters from September and October are going to start wearing down to the point where they don't offer a whole lot of protection. Joe? Now, I've got to say, they've got to really step up these names like Omnicron, what other Vicron? Name it Alphacron. When Alphacron comes out, I'll be hiding under my desk. I'll get whatever boosters we need. Like, these names got to mean something. It should be Freddy Krueger Kron. <laughs> that would scare people. What it, What about Nazi Kron? If that came out, would <laughs> oh we all gosh, be I like, know, let's we get away from it. it? Yeah, half the country <laughs> would be lock and step. Ukraine Kron. Uh, Ukraine Kron. <laughs> are we getting versions of COVID or are we just naming Transformers for the next reboot? <laughs> Well, speaking of it, we were on the subject of drive-in movies, so let's move to entertainment. You know what movie is uh, 30 years old, I believe, this week? Basic Instinct, 30 years old. Do you remember where you were when you saw it for the first time? I do. A, a date took me. It was really uncomfortable because I don't think I'd been dating this person for that long, and I don't think we knew each other in a physical way. I think it was just starting, um, so it was a really bad movie to go to. <laughs> um, and the, uh, the other thing, I, the thing I really, really remember is the, the, um, the movie's famous for uh, crossing the leg scene that everyone talks about. Yes. Right. And I remember I had dropped something, um, my glasses, or I, I was looking down and everyone gasped or said something. And I looked up <laughs> and I had Missed it, obviously. I mean, it's, it's quick, quick, <laughs> quick. And afterwards, uh, um, we met some people and that's all they talked about. And then I had to pretend like I saw it. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I Scandalous. Terrible. Oh, my goodness. I was shocked. I tell you. And then someone told me what they saw. And I was like, oh, I kind of missed it. But, you know, um, I was I was reading an article about the 30 year anniversary and, you know, while most of us think of that scene as being the controversial moment in the film, what I think actually was a bigger controversy was the depiction of lesbianism and that uh, it's suggesting that lesbians are, you know, maniacal murderers that use ice picks to kill men. And uh, the gay community was up in arms about that film. I wasn't quite as aware of it back then. But reading about it, I understand it was a it was a big controversy at the time. Yeah, I do remember that. Like it's it's part of that whole um, obviously she she's not like normal hetero. So obviously she's evil. And then there's a lesbian, a full lesbian. So obviously she's more evil. <laughs> um, I mean, it was it was pretty ridiculous and it doesn't hold up well. Um, and then uh, Michael Douglas Anytime Michael Douglas is in a film, like uh, what's what's the one with Demi Moore? Disclosure, not disclosure. So that film, Disclosure, Fatal Attraction, it's just like all these women want to have sex right, with that Michael was the other. Douglas. <laughs> I mean, they just can't stop themselves. Demi Moore is going to lose her career over it. Sharon Stone will kill. People leave it. Janine Triplehorn is going to do terrible things for Michael Douglas. Right. Michael Douglas? Are you guys <laughs> kidding me? <laughs> Michael Douglas? I well, mean, he, a, he was the sex symbol of that era. It's kind no, of funny now. <laughs> no, no. Look at him in that film. He's he's 
he's like my age now. And I mean, the, the whole thing, he's like, well, you know, and he takes off his shirt and I'm like, put it back on, <laughs> put it back on. He's not an attractive man. Yeah. That's another thing that made that movie uh, somewhat, uh, you know, it got it a lot of attention was that it gave sexual agency to women, much as Disclosure <laughs> did. And, you know, now I don't know. I think that there's a lot of entertainment that's showing women as being sexual beings with sexual desires and sexual drive. But back then that was considered, uh, wow, that's really modern, you know? The, the thing that I just read is that male nudity is now becoming a much more acceptable yeah. in entertainment. And in fact, up until about three years ago, 70% of all nudity that you would see was female nudity um, because, you know, it was story driven and it was important that, you know, the the female lead took off her shirt at this crucial moment, you know, while they were defusing the bomb. <laughs> But you would never see the male lead take off his pants or anything like that because Lord forbid someone sees someone junk. But now it's becoming a little more common. And in fact, I just saw two or three films and John Cena. I've been seeing him naked so much. I don't know. I feel like we've been roommates. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's almost disturbing. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's this new series uh, streaming. And it's about a, a new a woman's magazine, uh, and the and the woman who comes up with the idea. She she wanted to do a feminist magazine, and she hooked up with a guy who's publishes is, porn magazines. Is and, it called Minx? Yes, Minx. That's the one. Thank you. And and there is a there is a montage in the first episode of men's penises, men jiggling their junk. Um, it's kind of funny. It's a little, ugh, you know, because. They didn't pick out particularly sexy men and average men. Our junk is not much to look at. <laughs> um, there is there. There is a TV show in France, I think, or yeah, I can't remember where it is. And it's called a uh, naked attraction. Uh huh. And the whole show, it starts with well, the whole point is that you, you meet someone, you go on a date totally naked. Okay? I love it. And, but the, the funny part is, is that when you first start to meet the person, it, it starts at the bottom and it reveals going up. Okay. So it's a slow reveal. And so the first thing the female sees is the gentleman's genitalia and so on and so on. They're like, Oh, and I always picture that someone going, yeah, this isn't going to work out right now. I'm leaving. Um, because like you say, most males, or do they go, yeah, no, no, that's not going to work out. That's pretty ridiculous looking. <laughs> but yeah, and, and that's the whole premise of the show. It's been on, I think, for six seasons. Anything else we should cover before we wrap this sucker up? I want to bring uh, up one last thing because we've been talking about the Russia conflict and I'm not going to bring it to pro wrestling this week. I'm from <laughs> Jewish City. I've got some class. I'm going to bring it to the WNBA because... Brittany Griner has been detained in Russia since February 17th. And this speaks to many things. You can talk about how women athletes in the U S are paid versus kind of the NBA because she's a WNBA star, two time Olympic champion. And in the off season, she goes to play to goes to play for a team in Russia. She went over to play over there and on February 17th, a dog detected cannabis oil in her luggage. This opened an investigation into allegations of large-scale transportation of drugs, which is a charge that carries a possible 10-year sentence. And she plays for the Russian team UMMC E. Katerinburg. Sorry, I butchered that pronunciation. But she's played over there for six years. So you would think traveling back and forth to a country you would have some familiarity with it. And there are certain people, Representative Sheila Jackson and Senator Tim Kaine, that are worried she's going to be used as a political pawn. Oh, there's no doubt. It's not even worry. It's, it's pretty much what's ha It's pretty obvious that's what's happening. Absolutely. So out of curiosity, was she carrying cannabis oil? Is that illegal? Okay, so she was carrying cannabis oil 
I have not seen any definitive reports about the quantity, yeah. but they said it was a substantial quantity. I don't know the terminology that they use in Russian law, yeah. but to, to, it, it, it was a felony in, in their law. Now, now here's the thing. Right. One, I'm not convinced that she was actually carrying that much. I think that they kind of may be lying about that. I know it's hard to believe that the Russians might lie about something. <laughs> but I will say, first of all, I think it's a travesty of what's happening to her. It's unjust. It's inhuman. Uh, she's being used as a political pawn, and she should be released immediately. That said, and I tell this to my kids, and they don't listen to me anymore because I've said it too many times. No one should be going across a border with anything that's an illegal substance of any kind, anywhere. Don't travel with that stuff because this is what happens. And she should not have been traveling with it. Now, people might say, oh, Kevin, you're so old fashioned. It's cannabis oil. Maybe she had a little weed. First of all, she's not accused of having weed, but maybe she had a little weed. It's 2022. Yeah, I know it's 2022. I have no problem with that stuff but you don't carry it across an international border because they will nail you if they want to. 100%. And Russia has been accused of possibly planting things on people. So the amount is questionable, but I'm going to be honest. If I was going to Russia to play basketball for three months, I would probably bring three to five vape cartridges to last me for that time. Unofficially. I think do it. (laughs) Oh no. Like I'm just saying like being somebody who does smoke, that's probably what I would plan on, but not in Russia. It's like going to Japan with that. Maybe if you're going to Florida, yeah, bring your weed. You're going to Russia or Japan. uh, I'd find something better to do. Maybe go Uh, for a walk in a safe park. I think we're in agreement. <laughs> yeah. Ask ask Paul McCartney how taking weed to Japan worked out for him. Oh, wait, I don't know that story. I, oh, I yeah. Pa- Paul McCartney. Um, I don't know the name, it? by the way. Uh, Paul McCartney is this guy. <laughs> he uh, I, I, he played in a small band. But okay. when he was on tour with Wings um, in uh, <laughs> 1980, uh, he got he got arrested for bringing in weed and he was with his wife and his kids and he got put in jail for like 10 days and they they had like all his tour dates and they were like thank you for playing they put him in jail for 10 days and they deported him back and Uh, supposedly he wasn't allowed in japan for like years and years and years I, i can't tell you how many times i have told my kids do not go on tour with wings yeah i had i've said recipe for getting arrested don't be like Paul McCartney. I say that all the time. <laughs> I was, don't be. I was like, they're like, really? And I said, yeah. Well, yeah. listen, we've run a little longer than I would have uh, anticipated. So we're going to say thank you for listening. If you like what we do here, please not only put our link on your Facebook timeline and tell your friends to listen, but find us on iTunes and rate review us. We would love to see your review there. Don't forget, I've got a book out. It's called Super Vows. It's available on Amazon in both hard copy, I mean, hardcover, paperback, and the Kindle version. It's a fun little read. And uh, Joe, anything you want to plug? Listen to the Working Fans podcast if you're into wrestling, MMA, or comedy talk. And there just like go. every week, I get by with a little help from my friends. <laughs> <laughs> and Greg... How will you be spending the rest of your uh, week or month or year or life? Well, being best friends with Will Ferrell didn't work out so well last week. Oh, no. Damn it. Damn it. So uh, I I guess I'm going to uh, I guess I'm going to take Paul McCartney up on trying to sneak him back into Japan. Uh, That's (laughs) that's going to be be his uh, be my thing. Just don't put any cannabis oil in your saxophone, Greg. Uh, They're going to check it. They, they always check the saxophone. They always look at the sax player. Like, <laughs> obviously, this guy's high. 